we define our time frame. And here, um, yeah, I, I set it to like create a time window of 10 minutes. And within these, this um, time window, I will compute um, by calling sum the, the uh, number of impressions I've received. Okay, that's um, the job. Uh, this gives us a new data stream where the um, tweet uh, contains now the counts for, for the impressions um, in the last 10 minutes. And in order to, to execute the program, you have to specify um, a sync. In our case, it's simply printing it out. And then we have to uh, trigger the execution by calling execute. Okay, that was um, quite easy, I guess. Um, but already at this um, simple example, you've seen uh, an important concept uh, of stream processing, which is um, giving, we have to, for, for aggregations, um, we have to define uh, a time frame, or what we call the window. Um, Link comes with um, different uh, notions for windows. The simplest one is the uh, tumbling window, which is basically a uh, contiguous, uh, non-overlapping um, window. So it splits up your input stream into um, segments of four elements, <coughs> in this case. And on these four elements, you can, for example, do the aggregation of uh, summing it up, which will give you, in this case, 27, here we have 22, and 8. Um, slightly more powerful a window is um, the sliding window, uh, which allows you to have overlapping windows. So by defining a sliding window of uh, length 4, uh, so it contains again 4 elements, with a slide length of 2, which basically says that um, the first two elements of each window are overlapping with the last two elements of the preceding window. Um, you have, have a different um, window semantics which lets you do different things. Um, here, in our example, the window length depends on the, the size, on, on the number of elements. But you could also define it um, depending on um, the time. And um, for time, things of course processing time, which means the time uh, when an element is arrives at an operator, as well as event time, which means the time uh, when, it, when it, an event was created. This is really uh, powerful because this means that we can um, handle out of uh, order elements. So if you read, for example, from multiple sources, uh, it's not sure that, that all ele elements will arrive in order. And for that, you need event time support. And if the, the windows, which are, support, which are like the tumbling and the sliding window, which are uh, supported natively by, by Flink, isn't enough for use case, you can also use uh, quite a custom window with the, the um, evictor and trigger uh, model, I think. That's not a big deal. Okay, so far so good. Um, the problem with Windows uh, is that they keep the, the data I want. So um, as long as the window is not finished and hasn't been computed, you have to store the, the data somewhere. And in case that the window is either really long or um, the, the elements uh, are really large in size, it might, be, might not be feasible to do so. And um, when it comes to counting, we don't really need the information of the uh, events, right? So the only thing we need is um, to know that there was an element, and then we have to increment a counter along the effect zone. So um, to do it a little bit more memory efficient, um, we can create a um, stateful mapper, which simply increments a counter value every time it sees a new element. Um, that's a different way to implement uh, a solution for this problem of counting impressions. Mm. How would that look like um, in the API? Well, the only difference to the uh, previous program is that instead of um, a sum uh, for the sum method, we call the map with state method, which takes uh, uh, a function which has two parameters. First, first parameter is um, the event data, so our tree. Uh, the second is the state, which is uh, a long, which you can use a different function to calculate the current um, count value and where we increment it to, to reflect the, the new one. Mm. That is quite easy. However, what happens if, um, well, the machine on which our operator once crashes? Then our data is lost, right? And henceforth, 
we are counting incorrectly, which is uh, not what I've said before, that Flink gives you exactly one uh, processing guarantees. Um, so um, there has to be some, some mean to, to uh, recover from a failure like, like a machine outage, for example. And what we basically have to do, or what the system has to do, that's to store your, um, your state somewhere. And uh, what this basically means is that um, the, system has, the system has to be capable of um, drawing a distributed snapshot from a parallel data flow, um, including the operator states. Since um, Flink uses a continuous uh, streaming model, which means that all the operators of your data flow are online at the same time, and the, the events are continuously streamed uh, from one operator to the um, next operator once they're there um, ready, it's not so um, trivial. So you somehow have to uh, synchronize the individual operators um, and to tell them when to take um, a snapshot so that the, um, the, the complete snapshots or every operator gives you a consistent, um, uh, consistent snapshot. <coughs> what this happens with Blink is um, by introducing uh, barriers or markers in the uh, the stream pipelines between the operators. Um, here's important to note that the, these barriers cannot overtake uh, and cannot be overtaken by the elements which um, are streamed before and behind the, the markers. This means that whenever an operator, let's say here's our um, state for mapper, sees um, this marker, it knows that it has now seen all elements up to this point. <coughs> and it can now take a snapshot of its state, and if all other operators behave similarly, um, the, the overall um, snapshot uh, will be consistent. It can be, can be um, recovered, it can be used for uh, recovery. Mm. And in terms of processing guarantees uh, in the streaming, streaming world, which are at most once, at least once, and exactly once, with this um, asynchronous um, barrier snapshotting algorithm, how we call it, uh, we can guarantee all of these three um, guarantees. It is, um, well, the first guarantee, the at most once, actually, uh, well, not so useful in real world problems because it basically says that you might see an event in an operator but um, well if it crashed then you might not see it as well so um, no guarantees at all it's easy to, to realize uh, a slightly harder guarantee the at least once basically says that you will see every element once but in case of, of a failure it might happen that you see or, or that you that you process some of the elements um, multiple times. And exactly once means basically that in your final result, um, every element will be accounted for exactly once. And that is the, the hardest one, actually, uh, but also the most important one. However, as a user, um, just to know, usually um, the at least once guarantee is, is for most use cases sufficient. Um, and you would always use or uh, choose the, the weakest guarantee to minimize the overhead. Okay, what would what does does this um, checkpointing uh, now mean for our stateful mapper? Okay, well, if we take a look at it, uh, it looks like before the only difference is that by enabling the checkpointing mechanism, the system inserts these um, barriers into your input stream. Uh, what the operator does is whenever it sees such a uh, barrier, it will take the value it, it has currently stored in its uh, count value and write it to some state backend. In our case, it is HFS here. But this state backend uh, is configurable. And um, but currently, we support um, five systems, uh, well, including HFS, uh, memory state backend, and working, we are currently working on a RoxDB um, state backend. So for your user function or for, your, for the implementation of that, um, it's completely transparent. So you don't have to bother about um, what's happening behind the scenes. <coughs> okay. Um, now let's take a look at, uh, at the performance and what's the, what's the impact of these um, 
segmenting mechanism as on, on the overall performance. When we talk about performance in the streaming sector, uh, we always talk about, or have to talk about latency and throughput. These are the, the two important uh, measures. Mm. Due to the fact that Blink has this, this continuous streaming model, um, where, where the, the operators are always online, and uh, once an element has been processed, it can be sent to the downstream operators, it, it can achieve really low latency. Um, but to be precise, in order to also achieve uh, the throughput rate, the elements are not directly sent to the, to the downstream operators, but they are buffered before. Um, and they are sent to the downstream operators once the buffer is full, or once um, a buffer timeout has occurred. And with this buffer timeout, we basically have an upper um, um, value for upper bound for, for the latency aspect. And in order to show you that, we run an experiment where we had uh, a simple input stream we went from Kafka. We grouped uh, on, on some key and counted the elements uh, in each group. And we ran this experiment on a 13 node GCE cluster with, um, I think it was like four cores and 15 gigabytes of RAM. Um, yeah, there were the specs. And we measured the latency, which is the green line here, versus the aggregated throughput. Um, and that, we, we did that uh, for varying uh, slices of the buffer timeout. So starting from zero to 100 milliseconds. <coughs> you can see, with an increasing buffer timeout, um, the latency also increases because the elements stay longer in the buffer and it's, it's more likely that the elements are sent to the downstream operators once the buffer is full, the longer the buffer timeout is. Um, however, the, the um, upside of this is that also the uh, throughput increases. So as a user, you can use this buffer timeout to, to tune your system uh, either to having lower latency or higher throughput. Um, next, we wanted to know what's the effect of the um, checkpointing mechanism on the overall throughput. What we did is we fixed for the same job where we have a, a, a grouping, which means a network shuffle. Uh, we fixed the buffer timeout to 50 uh, milliseconds and computed once the aggregated throughput uh, without checkpointing and one with uh, exactly once, so with the uh, checkpointing enabled. And as you can see, for, um, for the without checkpointing, we could achieve, I think it was like 80 or 7 million events per second. That's what we could process. Uh, and with the checkpointing or the exactly once processing guarantees, um, we had um, 82 million um, events. So by sacrificing approximately like 4% of, of the throughput, you achieve um, exactly once processing guarantees, which is a really great result. Okay, so much for the um, performance. Now let's um, take a look at the future and what's uh, going to happen uh, within the next month. So now I've, I've talked um, well, about counting. Counting means like having a long value, which is not really a big. However, however, it happens that the state of operators can grow quickly really large. For example, if you have an NLP, mo uh, NLP model in your operator, then it can easily be um, several hundred um, megabytes. And writing this model to, to some disk to store it um, can take some time. And with the current implementation, the problem is that the um, writing this, this data um, out uh, stores the operator and also the, the processing of incoming events, which is for stream processing, uh, well, kind of prohibitive. Um, so what we are currently working on is um, asynchronous snapshot so that the, the processing of the events can, can continue while um, storing the, the current state to some um, persistent storage. Um, additionally, uh, we've seen, as I've said, some of the state can be really large, um, so that it cannot be uh, kept in the, on the heap. So um, what we additionally uh, work on is an out-of-core state, so that uh, once your state grows so big that it can't be held in the memory, that it will gracefully spill to disk, uh, where it can also be retrieved uh, again. Uh, 
that's one, one um, big thing we're working on. Next, um, we've noticed that during the uh, stream job, the, the load is not always a constant. So what you usually do to meet your SLAs is to pr provision for the maximum um, um, well input you, you can expect. However, this means that most of the time you will waste some, some resources because um, you don't uh, receive this high um, uh, input uh, rate. So what we want to do, or what we are currently implementing, is um, dynamic scaling in and scaling out. Which means <coughs> that whenever Flink detects that there's a slow operator, like for example, let's say here, uh, that it will uh, spawn a new operator so that the, the uh, load is more uh, evenly distributed uh, across all operators and that the, the um, uh, SFAs uh, well, can be kept again. And the same works the, the other way around as well, that whenever an operator um, idles too long, uh, it will be um, the, the DOP of the, of the topology will be, will be decreased so that you don't waste any resources. Um, however, that only works uh, if like the, the architecture is, is capable of, of requesting new resources, um, which means new machines, and releasing these machines uh, from a resource manager. And currently we support Yarn as um, such a resource manager, but we have this feature that, that when the job manager sees, okay, I need a new task manager to deploy some more tasks, um, I will um, tell my resource manager, and the resource manager will give me that. And also, when the task manager is idle, it can be released. And um, this will also be part of the um, new Mesos integration, which will also happen uh, in the next uh, month. Okay, last but not least, um, there's also some, some other cool stuff going on uh, with declarative uh, queries. Uh, currently, uh, we have contributors working on Stream SQL, which will um, basically bring SQL to the streaming world um, so that you can use um, your SQL knowledge also with streams. Um, and we, we, we are implementing um, complex event processing, so that's really easy, um, not touching um, too much code um, to detect complex event patterns in, in your, your streams. For example, if you want to um, detect uh, like suspicious behavior in your, your network, uh, you might define some, some rules, and uh, this could, could be used to um, detect uh, intrusion, for example. And with that, um, I, well, yeah, the only thing which is left now is to, to conclude my talk. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you got excited about it and uh, want to well, stay tuned, you should check out um, think that the page of talk. They will also find the mailing list to which uh, one can subscribe. And, um, Take a look at the code, which you find uh, on GitHub, or follow us on uh, Twitter. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, when snapshotting on the local disk, how do you ensure all tolerance? With local disk, of course, uh, they don't have. Uh, you would have to, to uh, set it to HFS, for example, where this replicated. There, there was a benchmark made by Yahoo, it was also looked by, by you, that mm -hmm. showed very uh, less performance for Flink than what you have shown here. So how can you explain the difference? Um, well, actually, the, the benchmark done by Yahoo measured the latency of um, to say the Redis throughput, um, uh, and the, the results were not bad for Flink actually. They were uh, on par with um, Storm, uh, which is known for having good, really good uh, latencies actually. Um, moreover, here's the, the um, benchmark. The measurement of latency is really difficult in uh, distributed settings because the, the clocks might not be um, synchronized between the machines. So even slight changes will um, disturb the results of the measurements. Um, and the way um, the, the way the Yahoo guys measured the latency was basically that they um, they had a job, then they um, was basically a map operation or the um, well a group operation, and then they um, 
in this, this operator, they made a lookup to a Redis um, store to, to do a, like a join operation. Like, um, and um, this result, they, they um, <coughs> wrote every second um, to, to uh, some, some database to, to measure the, the latency between um, um, the time point when it was written and the end point of the window of one second. So, um, uh, which, which basically means that if, even if you assume you have a latency of zero, um, then the element would arrive in the first window, but wouldn't be written to um, the, the um, store after, before one second has passed, because only after one second it was written to uh, this database. Uh, that way the latency measurement uh, was kind of um, flawed in, in uh, our opinion. Um, so, uh, but the overall results were so that that uh, Flink and Storm were on par uh, with respect to latency. Throughput was not measured there. Uh, if, if I have my query mm -hmm. and then I call execute, can I change the query during runtime? Uh, no. It's at the moment it's like a, um, uh, like think of having a, a static uh, query. Where the data is piped uh, through and then compiled. Uh, yeah, I mean, with the API or with um, if you specify it um, as a SQL uh, query, you construct a data flow graph which is uh, um, compiled to some some internal structure which you then use to to um, execute the, um, the the specification distributed. I want to move away from the. Uh, Rational database to uh, even so single database streams. Um, can Flink help to collect transactions? Um, Flink allows to um, <coughs> um, within Flink, the the uh, you have guarantees that that there won't be data lost um, using this this checkpointing mechanism. However, once you you um, Cross the border from Flink to a different system, they have to interact. I mean, the, the system has to, to respect the, the um, these checkpointing notifications to make sure that, that um, no data is written twice, for example. If you do that, then yes. But you have to, to implement it for, for the uh, specific connector you're using there. Um. One last question. Could it be different ways that you can connect Yeah, what do you want to connect with Flink? Uh, say, like, uh, like some type of IoT protocol. Like, uh, MQT or something like that. I mean, um, the, the way to, to connect to Flink uh, as, as, as a client is uh, you have. Um, Use Akka internally, so you have like can can uh, basically send Akka message to it. But um, usually, what what you usually do to, to ingest data is you have connectors, and there's a wide variety of actually all Hadoop um, uh, compatible stuff which, which is supported. I mean, uh, all Hadoop input formats can be used, but there's no other way. I mean, uh, that's not true. You can use uh, the REST interface to uh, request some some uh, metrics, but there's no other way to interact with the uh, system yet, like uh, other protocols. Um, not yet foreseen. Why can't I use Spark Streaming? Well, you shouldn't <laughs> use it. Um, but the thing is that they use um, different, um, the concepts are different. Um, Spark uses mini batches to simulate um, streaming which uh, might be enough for some use cases. However, what you basically do is you you, um, um, you don't have such um, flexible window, windowing semantics as with a continuous stream model. Um, that's one ex uh, reason why you, sh uh, you think that the continuous stream model is, is superior. Um, and because of this, this mini-batching, you have um, really high latencies. So if your use case uh, which you want to solve um, requires low latencies, then um, it 
it's almost always not possible to do it with Spark, for example. Take the rest of the questions, please. Yeah, I mean, the question on IoT, also the same with Spring, is you have a socket connector, for example, on a string string. You can design for a socket. Uh, yes, yes, that you can do. And, and the difference, for example, with Spring and with Spring, from Spark in this case, we will receive the message and process them immediately as they go inside. And this will be a big differentiator of Spark. Yeah. 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 Yeah.